Hello. Hi. Yes. Uh, I will. I will ask you. Since when did you work as illustrator and and for comic books? And what made you interested to be a uh, an illustrator? Well, I did my uh, my first comic that I did entirely by myself was a comic called Kabuki, and I I wrote and drew it for my senior thesis in literature when I was in college. And that Kabuki volume that I did in college, that's what got me the offer to write Daredevil. So my first work for Marvel was as a writer uh, for the Daredevil series. And all my life I like to write stories and tell stories in different ways and do a variety of different kinds of art. So for me, comic books were a medium that united and integrated all of the other mediums that I was interested in. And so I really enjoyed, you know, writing for other artists, but I, I also, with Kabuki even, I, I, the only, I had only intended to write it and was trying to find another artist that was, that was better than me. So in 1993, I met Brian Michael Bendis and he was working as an artist at the time and he was going to be the original artist for Kabuki. Eventually, I started doing this, tricked myself into doing some art for it as well. Okay. So, um, so uh, Kabuki is a Japanese-style comic book, right? So, what is your inspiration of it? Like, I know that you are from the Western side, but you've got really good uh, ideas of Kabuki itself. So, I just want to know what inspires you to do the Japanese culture instead of the Western. Oh, side. thanks. Um, yeah, that first Kabuki volume. Uh, it takes place in Japan, and I, when I was in college, I wanted to do a very personal comic book, but I was so young when I was doing it that I didn't feel unselfconscious enough to do like an autobiographical comic. So I thought if I made uh, the main character a different gender and I put it in a different part of the world, that I could tell personal stories without feeling self-conscious that people would think it was me. And I was taking uh, Japanese language and history and mythology when I was in college, so I was learning a lot of things that I was able to funnel into the story and kind of use that as kind of archetypes and uh, metaphors that I could tell the story through. So I felt like if I could tell it through these kind of uh, images and metaphors, maybe it would, people would like, it would be universal enough that people could look at the story and characters and see themselves in it rather than feeling self-conscious that they were looking at me about it. ID. Uh, I want to ask you about how do you feel? Uh, can you feel, can you tell us in three words how do you feel about this event, Indonesia Comic Con? In three words. It is wonderful. Wonderful. It is. Three words. <laughs> no, no. I mean, uh, for example, it's uh, hot or busy or something like that. It is very busy. It's very <laughs> crowded. Wonderful. People are enthusiastic. Yeah. Enthusiastic. Passionate. Passionate. <laughs> That's more than three uh, words. <laughs> Okay, so wonderful. Kind people, yeah. Well, it's very friendly. Okay. Yeah, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> okay, thank you. were like when they were a kid, if they thought like, if they grew up in the 
50s or the 60s or something and they felt like comics were for kids then or maybe they didn't read it. Um, I think some people had that perception, but the people who actually read comics, I think, are very aware that comics is a very fertile medium. It's a very diverse medium. And there's an opportunity to tell stories for all different age levels, for all kinds of, you can tell any kind of story in comics, I feel. You know, it can, it can be a whimsical story or a serious story, a historical story, a personal, autobiographical, fiction, nonfiction. And how, how we can, how do you think we can change this people's mindset? Uh, hmm, I don't know if I'm interested in changing. I mean, I just feel like you should tell whatever story you want to do, and it'll find its audience. I think that you just you try to focus on the content. And for me, comics are like the delivery system. And you tell the best content you want, and then hopefully it finds its audience. And it doesn't really bother me that um, some people will look down on comics or not sure. I kind of think of comics as like the rock and roll of literature. Oh, you know? hey. Like when uh, you know rock and roll comes yeah. out, some people maybe like they think it's oh it's not real music. You know classical music is real music, or this isn't real music. But of course it's the vital music. It's the most the really interesting uh, stuff that's happening with the most passion of the current times. And just like rock and roll, which is a hybrid medium, it's a medium that's rock and roll is composed of like rockabilly and jazz and gospel and blues and funk and all this weird stuff started uh, being mushed together to make this hybrid thing that no one can really explain. That was then called rock and roll, but it's only still vital when it keeps uh, pulling from outside itself. When it copies up itself, it's not very interesting. But when it pulls from other music sources and combines them, it's interesting. And I think of comics as the same way. I think of comics as you know, it's not just story, it's not just art. You know, it's both of those, but it's also reflective of the times and it's reflective of the, of the person's personal passion and things. So I look at it that way. So the people who are saying like, oh, comics is just some kids, that's the same kind of people who are saying like, oh, this horrible rock and roll music, I can't wait to, you know, this music of the kids, I can't wait for it to go away. You know, it just, um, but that, an art, an art form that powerful always finds its audience. So I'm not really worried about what people think about it, you know? I just think you, you do the best work that you can in the story and it'll find, it'll find its audience. Because some people, like, just like you'll hear some music and you'll respond to it, some people will see certain stories and comics and artwork and I think they'll respond, you know, very personally to it. And I think that's what's most important. And I think over time, like now people think, rock, you know, people embrace rock and roll or there's a rock and roll hall of fame and all that kind of stuff. But that seemed ridiculous early on when it was happening. <laughs> you know that recently uh, people accept comedy when they are adapted to movies. You know, it will be like Iron Man and that's like that. So, is there any chance your comedy will be adapted into a movie? Yeah, I have a pretty good story about that. Um, early on, uh, H HBO, well, I, what I would say is. I had, Early on, HBO was interested in doing it as a TV series, oh. which I, I like the idea. I like the idea of movies, but I like the idea of TV series too because Kabuki is told in an episodic format, and you can tell the TV show that way. It's very similar. It's an episodic show that you like to a beginning and an end and a cliffhanger propels you to the next show, and so. Um, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> so with the. Uh, so early on, uh, HBO, maybe like in the mid-90s, uh, HBO was interested in doing a TV series of Kabuki, and so I met with HBO, and uh, then the producer at HBO uh, left, and they went to Fox, and she called me and said, hey, I'm, you can do it at HBO, but I was the main person there doing it, so maybe if I'm, since I'm going to Fox and doing movies, can I offer it as a, as a movie option at uh, Fox? And I said, yeah. And so then Fox uh, bought the option for Kabuki to make a film with it, and then we developed it there, they paid me to write it and so on for a while. And Fox ended up buying the option four times. And then, but um, I worked on it quite a bit while I was there. And then, but you know, the, the executives change. You know, so you, you might agree with the exec, you might see the same kind of movie, but then, uh, so you make the deal, you make the deal with Fox, but the executive keeps getting replaced. So at a certain point, I didn't feel like we were on the same page, and I got the rights back. 
And then uh, Quentin Tarantino's producer, Lawrence Bender, yeah. he uh, liked Kabuki. And so I met with Lawrence Bender in his office, and he said uh, he had just filmed uh, Kill Bill in Japan, yeah. and he had a really interesting idea. He said, I think this is, he's a very clever producer. This is a very out of the box idea. He said, um, so I know how to film in Japan. He said, here's like, what do you think of this idea? We film Kabuki in Japan, in Japanese, all Japanese actors, Japanese language, release it only in Japan. And we get to have a lot of fun with it, making it as a Japanese film. And then a couple years later, we do an American remake of our Japanese film. <laughs> Because I could talk. And I kind of like the idea because it would give us a chance to do our best version we could at the beginning and then maybe have a bigger budget and then fix everything that we thought we didn't quite get right the first time. And that was an interesting idea. Um, but he had a certain director in mind that he had to deal with or something, and for whatever time reasons, it didn't quite work out. And then uh, Neil Gaiman's producer, uh, Kat Mihos, I signed an option with Kat. Uh, with, with as producer, Neil is executive producer, to bring it to the screen and um, work with them for a while. And uh, most recently, there's some other developments happening with the play that I can't discuss yeah. in full at the moment, but I will just say that I like the idea, I, I like the way television is right now in terms of telling long form stories and episodic. I would like the idea of telling it as a TV show. There's always some really interesting Japanese artists that are always 